Hello and welcome to Disaster Assessment Fundamentals Just-In-Time Training. We are pleased that you're interested in donating your time and talent to support the American Red Cross disaster response. My name is Ray Thomas and I am a Disaster Assessment Supervisor and the Northeast Oklahoma Disaster Assessment Lead. If you're watching this video, it's likely that you are about to begin your assignment as a disaster assessment worker. This information applies to you whether you are brand new to disaster assessment or just as importantly to those of you who have been, quote, doing DA for many years. The reason is this. New damage assessment criteria and measurement techniques were released on May 16th of 2016. So whether you are new or experienced in DA, there is important information here that you will need to learn so that you can effectively do your job. Here's what we'd like to accomplish today. You will learn how to perform a detailed disaster assessment or a DDA. I will cover some personal safety considerations. We will identify some of the forms that you will need for your assignment. You will learn to accurately complete a rapid data collection worksheet also known as a street sheet. I will explain how to use the pocket guide to identify specific criteria for each damage classification category. Finally, you will learn to recognize, describe, and classify damaged dwellings. So let's begin with the basics. What is a disaster assessment? Disaster assessment is the process of observing, collecting, assessing, processing, and recording information about what has happened to each home affected by a disaster. In short terms, you are there to effectively communicate the condition of each damaged home to the disaster response management group. So, why do we do it? Early and accurate disaster assessment is crucial to the planning of an operation. Disaster management needs to quickly learn the scope of a disaster event so that they can move supplies, people, and equipment, or resources, into position for an effective response. An effective response means we are able to help people in need. With proper planning and accurate disaster assessment information, we can help more people more quickly and in an efficient manner. Disaster assessment provides information to help determine the number of shelters needed and the most appropriate locations to help displaced families. Our information is vital for planning where, when, and how to deploy feeding teams and bulk distribution teams. Knowing where we find concentrations of damage helps the casework planners effectively deploy their teams so that they can get clients on a path to recovery. Finally, we need disaster assessment information to assist our community partners, such as the county emergency managers, first responders, news outlets, and other help organizations. When you prepare to go to the field, you will be given appropriate instructions, street sheets, and other necessary forms, key contact information, a mobile phone or sometimes a radio, a list of shelters and feeding locations that have been set up, and information and maps describing the area of your assignment today. For safety reasons, disaster assessment teams always consist of at least two people. Please dress appropriately for the conditions. This likely includes long pants, sturdy boots or shoes, and perhaps rain gear. Always, always be aware of your surroundings. Disaster conditions create hazards. Be on your guard. Stay away from downed power lines and moving or standing water. 
Never smoke. There's always a possibility of explosive gases. Never enter an area that is marked private or no trespassing. This includes gated communities. If the individuals in those areas need assistance, they must contact the Red Cross. Large-scale disaster assessment assignments are designed to collect the maximum information in the minimum time. Normally, our assessment work is done without leaving our vehicles, although occasionally some DA collection is done while walking the area. If you do encounter people along the way, be polite, be professional, remember they have just suffered a life-changing disaster. Pass along only information as needed. Do not make promises or discuss situational information that you are not 100% sure about. Remember, your assignment is, quote, rapid data collection. Please end your conversation in a respectful way and get back to your assignment as quickly as possible. There are three primary kinds of disaster assessments. Since this is an abbreviated course today, we are only going to briefly mention the first two. We will spend the majority of our time discussing the Detailed Damage Assessment, or DDA, as this will normally be your assignment as a disaster assessment team member. An impact assessment is normally done by gathering and analyzing information at the very beginning of an operation. This may include demographic, political, or geographical information. It normally does not involve a DA team. A preliminary damage assessment will also normally be done in the early days of an event. I'll show you a quick example of this on the next slide. The Preliminary Damage Assessment Tally Sheet. This form is simply a method to collect broad estimates of damage over a large scale area. A street name is entered in the first column, Hudson Drive in my example. The hash mark counts indicate the number of homes observed. The marks are entered in the appropriate column to indicate the dwelling type, single family, mobile or apartment, the damage classification, destroyed, major, minor, affected, or inaccessible. Finally, enter the total of the hash marks in each column at the bottom of each completed page. This is necessary so that management can quickly assess the magnitude of the disaster event. As you have seen, even on the preliminary damage assessment, Knowing how to classify the damage that you observe in the field is imperative. So, how do we do that? The pocket guide is the document that defines how we classify the damaged dwelling. This guide was revised and reissued on May 16, 2016 and is now substantially equivalent to the FEMA damage guidelines. The ARC made only cosmetic modifications from the FEMA policies so that they would align with ARC assistance guidelines. Two basic definitions that I want to emphasize on this slide. First, inaccessible areas. Only homes that are inaccessible by reasonable means due to the disaster related loss of access are classified as inaccessible. This category indicates that the home could not be viewed at the time of the assessment. If you can assess the damage from a distance, then do so, that is, enter a damage classification. Don't simply enter inaccessible. Secondly, the new guide refers to, quote, essential living space. So the definition for that term is important to emphasize. Occupied bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchens, or living room. Basements are not essential unless they contain a needed bedroom, bathroom, or kitchen. Once again, because this is not a comprehensive disaster assessment program, I'm going to present only highlights for each damage classification. 
It's important to notice for each of the categories there are two distinct groups of damage descriptions. Single family and apartment criteria and manufactured home criteria. We no longer use the term mobile home. Manufactured homes include all forms of prefabricated home units. The description and measurement guides are very different between these two basic groups for each damage classification type. Affected for homes and apartments represents minimal damage to the structure or non-essential basement areas. This includes missing shingles, other cosmetic damage, damage to landscape, etc. Water in the crawl space or non-essential basement is included in this category. Effected for manufacture homes is similar. This can include cosmetic damage such as skirt damage. I'll be covering the flood gu guidelines for manufactured homes in a few minutes. Minor for homes or apartments represents damage that does not affect the structural integrity of the residence. This can include non-structural roof damage over living areas, damage to interior walls, doors, etc. Water in the home up to 18 inches in an essential living area is considered minor. Minor for manufactured homes includes no, as in zero, structural damage to the home. However, windows, doors, and wall coverings may have sustained damage. The key word is structural. Again, flooding will be covered later. Major for homes and apartments represents significant structural damage and requires extensive repairs. This can include complete or partial failure of the roof, walls, or foundation systems. Water in the home above 18 inches and up to 36 inches in an essential living space is considered major. Major for manufactured homes means the home is displaced from its foundation or piers or other structural components have been damaged. Destroyed for homes and apartments means the residence is a total loss and repairs are not feasible. I don't think I really need to say more. It simply means there is nothing there to repair. You can look to the pocket guide for specific examples. Water above 36 inches in an essential living area is considered destroyed. Destroyed for manufactured homes means the frame is bent or otherwise compromised, roof covering is missing, or stru structural ribbing has collapsed for the majority of the roof system. Okay, now for some photos to help us visualize what all these words mean. First, we will look at non-flood examples. In a few minutes, we'll take a look at flooding examples. The home shown here would probably be classified as affected. You'll notice partial or missing shingles, cosmetic damage, broken screens and windows, gutter damage, and debris. This also can include landscaping and downed trees. As you can see on this screen, this manufactured home suffered only cosmetic damage, including perhaps damage to the porch or carport, and as you can see, the skirting is damaged. The home shown here will probably be classified as minor damage. What you'll notice are non-structural damage to the roof components over an essential living space. Non-structural damage to interior walls and exterior components is also included in this, in this category, including broken window framings and missing siding. This manufactured home has suffered minor damage only. There is no structural damage apparent. Non-structural components have sustained damage, as in the siding. Windows, doors, and wall coverings may have all also been affected. The home in this photograph has sustained 
either partial or complete failure of some of the structural elements of the roof, failure or partial failure of some of the structural elements of the walls. This home would be classified as major damage. This manufactured home has been displaced from its foundation. You'll also see that structural components of the roof have been damaged. This home would be classified as major damage. This home would definitely be classified as destroyed. It has suffered complete failure of two or more of the structural components and probably requires immediate demolition. This manufactured home would be classified as destroyed. As you can see in the photograph, the frame is bent and twisted. The uh, wall systems have been compromised. The roof covering is missing and or has collapsed. A property would be classified as inaccessible uh, if it was beyond this point in the slide. Obviously, uh, you should never even get close to the situation and if there is no other way to reach the property the property would be classified as inaccessible. Now it's time to focus on flood related damage assessments. The diagram that you see is a single family dwelling or an apartment. The uh, lines indicate the uh, level of water that would be necessary to qualify that particular property for the damage assessment that we've described. As you can see, affected is below the surface of the home. Minor would be water line in an essential living space up to and including 18 inches. Major would be above 18 all the way to 36 inches and destroyed would be above 36 inches. This diagram will help you to understand the construction of the manufactured home floor system. This is important because flood damage classifications for manufactured homes is not based on the number of inches observed. Rather, it's based on which part of the floor system has been impacted by the flood water. The diagram shows three areas of measurement, one, two, and three. The first level results in a minor damage classification. The water has reached the home skirting, but did not reach the belly board or insulation. The second level requires a major damage classification. Water has reached the belly board, the insulation, and potentially the heating and air conditioning ducting systems. Any water at or above the floor level that's level three, classifies the home as destroyed. This is a more realistic view of what you will see when you encounter a manufactured home in the field. Typically, skirting is 24 inches. However, if the home is installed on uneven ground, the skirting can be much higher. For this reason, all measurements should begin at point A on this diagram. From that point, measure down 16 inches. Any water level that impacts the skirting below that point would be considered minor damage. The seam at point A is approximately 4 to 6 inches below the actual floor of the home. Measure up 6 inches from point A to determine where the destroyed classification begins. Major is any water level between those two final points, that is, above the minor line, but still below the actual floor level. This home would be classified as only affected. As you can see, the water level may have entered the crawl space or even a basement, but it has not entered an essential living area of the home. It does not appear that any mechanical components were damaged or submerged. This manufactured home has only cosmetic damage, 
which may include the porch or outbuildings. The skirting is slightly damaged, but water is not in contact with the skirting. This home would be classified as minor. What that means is the water level inside the uh, essential living space of the home is somewhere between 1 and 18 inches. It also can mean that as a result of the disaster or flood, the private well or septic system has been compromised. This manufactured home has a water line below the floor system and perhaps the HVAC is impacted. This house qualifies for a minor damage classification. This home would be classified as major damage. That means the water line is above 18 inches. What that means to us is 19 up to 36 inches. The water level is inside an essential living space of the home. It also can mean the water level is above the electrical outlets in the home. It also can mean that there is water at any level on the first floor of a residence with an essential basement. This manufactured home has a water line that has come in contact with the floor system, which includes the belly board, the insulation, the ductwork, and the subfloor. This home qualifies for a classification of major damage. For this home, it would be classified as destroyed. Obviously, the water level is above 36 inches in an essential living space. These manufactured homes have a water level that's obviously above the floor system of the homes. Once the water reaches the floor system, the, mo the uh, manufactured home is considered destroyed. Once again, as we discussed before, an area is inaccessible if it is inaccessible by reason of a disaster-related loss of access. The next two slides introduce the current street sheet form. This form is called the Rapid Data Collection Worksheet and was approved by National ARC leadership within the last year. First, I can't overemphasize the importance of printing legibly. Once you've completed your forms and returned them to the office, if the data entry personnel cannot read what you've written, you've wasted your entire day. It's also possible that additional teams may need to be sent back to the same location in order to get the needed assessments. Again, equally important with being legible is the spelling of street, city, and county names. This information is necessary so that caseworkers and others can find the home when the resident appears for help. Enter a geographical reference if it may be helpful. This can include a subdivision or apartment name complex. This is an example of a completed non-flood rapid data collection worksheet. Starting at the top, please enter the state, the county, the city, street name, a geographical reference if that is helpful, the DR number. Next, enter the house number that you're observing. Then, take a look at the house. Next, take a look at the pocket guide. Select the appropriate description from the pocket guide that matches what you're seeing. Please write a shortened version of that description in the description box next to the house number. And to the right of that house number, please place an X in the appropriate column aligned with the dwelling type as well, marking it as a single family a manufactured home or an apartment. Finally, be sure and bring down the total counts for each column at the end of this sheet. The sheet should also include your team number, your name, and the date at the bottom of the form. 
this slide is merely for your reference and is the written instructions that would be uh, appropriate for the non-flood example street sheet. This page is an example of a rapid data collection worksheet being used for a flood assessment. You'll notice the top boxes are the same as a non-flood example in that state, county, city, street name, geographical reference if needed, and the DR number. Uh, those things should be entered at the top of the form as always. However, for the assessments themselves, all that's necessary is the house number and the number of inches of water observed based on your, your uh, cl damage classification. So if it's 38 inches, which is more than 36, that home would be described as destroyed in that column. 4805, you observed 20 inches, which classifies that home as a major. For mobile homes, you do not enter the, uh, the number of inches. If you remember, our mobile home classifications are not based on inches of water. They're based on where the water level is compared to the floor system. So for a mobile home entry on, on this particular page, all you would enter is the house number, and then in the appropriate column, please just place an X. That will tell us that it is major, minor, destroyed based on your observation of where the water level was compared to the floor system of that particular home. The only time a description would be required for this home, for this uh, event, this flooding event, would be 3533. What you can see is that home is marked as inaccessible. We'd like you to put a quick description of why the property is inaccessible as a result of the uh, disaster itself. Once again, as I mentioned, you'll total the bottom of each column to indicate the number of homes that you assessed on this sheet for each of the damage categories that are uh, entered above. Also, please remember to put your team number, your name, and the date of your assessment at the bottom of the form. As before, this slide is here only to represent a written version of what I've just explained about how to use this form in a flood example. So here's what I hope you've learned today from this session. At this point, you should know how to perform a detailed disaster assessment, or a DDA, you should understand the need for safety precautions. Please understand that my examples were not all inclusive. Always be on your guard. You also should be able to accurately complete the rapid data collection worksheet, also known as the street sheet. You should understand how to use the pocket guide to identify criteria for each damage classification category. And finally, you should be able to describe and classify damaged dwellings in the field. Thank you all for your attention today. I hope you consider this program to have been a good investment of your time. It was my pleasure preparing this material for you. I wish you all the best on your disaster assessment assignment. Now let's get started.